My name is Robin, and I have the privilege of serving on the keynote team. And today's scripture passage is from 1 Samuel 20, verses 1 through 9, and 42 from the NIV. Then David fled from Naoth to Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, What have I done? What is my crime? How have I wronged your father that he is trying to kill me? Never, Jonathan replied. You are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything, great or small, without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. But David took an oath and said, Your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only a step between, between me and death. Jonathan said to David, Whatever you want me to do, I will do for you. So David said, Look, tomorrow is the new moon feast, and I'm supposed to dine with the king. But let me go and hide in the field until the evening of the day after tomorrow. If your father misses me at all, tell him, David earnestly asked my permission to hurry to Bethlehem, his hometown, because an annual sacrifice is being made there for his whole clan. If he says, very well, then your servant is safe. But if he loses his temper, you can be sure that he is determined to harm me. As for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. If I am guilty, then kill me yourself. Why hand me over to your father? Never, Jonathan said. If I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? In verse 42, Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, The Lord is witness between you and me, and between our, your descendants and my descendants forever. Then David left, and Jonathan went back to the town. This is God's word. Thank you, Robin. One of the titles given to Jesus upon his birth is Emmanuel, which means God with us. And through our Advent series, we're exploring some of the ways in which we experience God being with us. And one of them, one of the ways in which God is with us is in our relationships. Notice the title isn't God with me as an isolated individual, but with us. And the story of David and Jonathan is a beautiful picture of what it looks like to have God in the center of a relationship. Let me pray for us now and let's invite the Holy Spirit to speak to all of us that we might experience God's presence, not only in our lives as individuals, but among us as a community. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a relational God and you created us for relationship with you and with one another. We confess that it is often very hard living in this broken, sinful world where we have sinned and sinned against one another. We ask that you would speak into our relational life, the community life of this church, our marriages, our friendships, that we might experience healing where there's been wounds and encouragement where there's been discouragement. And I pray that in all of this, you would lead us to yourself, that we would remember and experience the relationship that we have with you through Christ. For anyone here this morning or those joining us online that do not yet have this relationship, that today they would believe in the finished work of Christ, that they too might be in a relationship with you. Holy Spirit, move. We ask in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Well, it was Mother Teresa, who many of you may know, spent a lifetime working in Calcutta, India, amongst the poor and destitute. And surprisingly, she said that the worst disease that she experienced there was not AIDS, nor leprosy, but loneliness. We were made for deep, meaningful relationships. 
we suffer without them. And yet very few of us have experienced them. There seems to be a famine of healthy relationships in our modern day. And as we think about relationships this morning, I'm talking about all of them, marriages, friendships, the relational life of this church, the people you serve with or in community group with, your extended family members, many of the people that we're gonna be seeing over the holidays, which we know for many of us can be a challenge. For that reason, many of us avoid relationships. But I believe not only for us to survive, but thrive, we need healthy community. Not just networks, not just associates, not just fans, employees, or employers, and definitely not just Facebook friends, because we all know that what that means. All Facebook is now is you get a happy birthday message, and didn't I look funny 15 years ago? That's all Facebook is now. I suppose one of the reasons for this famine is we've all the way we've all approached community and relationships. Some in good ways, but many of us maybe not so good ways. I think of Aristotle's famous three categories of relationships, three categories of friendships, and it might help us understand ours. The first category is relationships built on usefulness. Your commitment is primarily toward the benefit that you get from someone. Hey, they, they helped me out, or I... I I can climb the social ladder when I'm with this person or they got a lot of money, so they take me on their vacation. I love them, <laughs> you know. Those are relationships built on usefulness. The second category he observed is relationships built on entertainment. Your primary commitment is to amusement. Like, I just have a good time and, and that's great. But the third category, he said, was the most important, the greatest That is a relationship built on virtue, which is about your character, the strengthening of your character, where you have a shared vision of life and you help one another towards it. Those are relationships built on virtue. Well, the Bible tells us that there is no greater pursuit in life than the pursuit of God. And though the degrees of our relationships in this life will vary, the deepest and fullest are found in God. And so we remember in this Advent season that God came to be with us. And that means our relationships. So how are we building and maintaining our relationships right now? If we don't ask those questions, then this area might become our Achilles heel, an area of weakness that we have not tended to. But the good news is this, that even if life changes and you don't remain in the same job or neighborhood or city or even state, then if you maintain these healthy relationships, you will become more and more like Jesus along the way. For at the heart of Christian faith is a relationship with God through his son. And it is the arrival of his son that we celebrate at Christmas, his life, death, and resurrection serve as the foundation for our relationship. And so Jesus himself said in John 15, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. In this season, we remember that through Jesus, because of him, we are able to have the deepest relationship of all. So what does that have to do with David and Jonathan? Well, the story in our text is like looking at a long shadow that leads to Christ. For of the many relationships highlighted in scripture, the friendship and relational life of David and Jonathan is remarkable. What does it look like when God is with us in our relationships? Well, there's four marks, and the first is this. Number one, when God is with us in our relationships, it means we are to be vulnerable. It means we are to be vulnerable. We're willing to bear our souls. Look again at verses one through three and notice the transparency and vulnerability of the relationship between David and Jonathan in a moment of crisis. 
Then David fled Naoth at Ramah and went to Jonathan and asked, what have I done? What is my crime? What, how have I wronged your father that he's trying to kill me? Never, Jonathan replied, you are not going to die. Look, my father doesn't do anything great or small without letting me know. Why would he hide this from me? It isn't so. But David took an oath and said, your father knows very well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan must not know this thing or he will be grieved. Yet as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, there is only a step between me and death. Now, some backstory is helpful. Saul was Israel's first king. If you read the Old Testament, you'll learn that he started out well, but he became terrible. And one of the aspects of him being terrible was his raging jealousy of one of the rising stars in his army, David. Yes, the one who killed Goliath. And out of Saul's jealous rage, Saul tried to kill David on numerous occasions because he feared that David would take his throne. And so it is at this point in the story that David's like, man, this guy's trying to kill me constantly. And so it's time for David to escape. He shares this freely to his best friend, who happens to be Saul's son. Thankfully, Jonathan knows his dad's crazy. And he's willing to listen to his friend. So notice the the nature of the exchange between David and Jonathan in this time of crisis. David's able to speak vulnerably and, and honestly. And as I've said many times before, I love David. He just, he's like, I'm gonna die. And then Jonathan's a little naive. He's like, never. You know, I just, I love the, the honesty of their relationship here. Jonathan was not, fully convinced of the problem. He's like, no, my dad's not trying to kill you. And David's like, oh yes, he is. See, in godly relationships, there's a willingness to move beneath the surface, to remove the mask, to stop managing your appearance or your performance. Which is sadly what often characterizes our relationships, even in the church. We all know what it's like to kind of, you know, put, put your best foot forward and, and wear, wear the mask so that when someone asks, how are you doing? You're like, fine. I mean, I suppose there's two extremes, right? If you're like me, you wear your heart on your sleeve. Pastor Tim, how's it going? Terrible. Oh, I wasn't really expecting you to answer that. So I'm just going to keep walking by. <laughs> Or some of us are the opposite. Like, how's it going? It's amazing. I don't know if you've seen that meme with the dog who's drinking a cup of coffee at a table and everything's on fire. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's just that it's fine. Everything is fine. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that we could share that with everyone or you should just go up to a total stranger, but with people you know, where there's some history and some credibility there, there should be a willingness to speak your mind. In other words, you don't just talk about what happened, but how you experience what happened. How many times have you said, what'd you do today? I worked. Oh, that's good. But rather, how did you experience your work today? Oh, it was stressful. Oh, why was it stressful? How did you feel when it was stressful? See, these kinds of relationships are meant to be a, a refuge where you speak your mind without fear. Now, some of you have this. And if you do, continue to cultivate that kind of safe vulnerability. But some of you right now are saying, well, I don't have that. How can I cultivate that? Well, here's a very practical tip. Ask two questions. Maybe you've recently joined a community group or a serving team in the church and you're like, oh, I just feel like I don't really know these people that well or we just need to move beneath the, the surface. Look, just ask two simple questions. What are you finding encouraging right now? And what are you finding challenging? Start with those two questions. 
it just takes you beneath the surface. David here is sharing very freely with Jonathan. Granted, they had a long history. But we can start that by simply asking, hey, what are you finding encouraging right now? Or what are you finding challenging right now? See, this kind of safe vulnerability requires two things. Listening graciously and speaking honestly. That's what we see in the relationship between David and Jonathan. On the one hand, you see there's a gracious listening demonstrated by both David and Jonathan here. David's like, Jonathan, I don't think you really hear me. He's like, my dad's not going to kill me. He's like, yeah, he just threw a spear at me last week. By the way, if you think your family's drama, just look at David's family. Like David married Saul's daughter. So Saul's like his father-in-law. And yet whenever he goes to his father-in-law's house, his father-in-law like literally in one occasion throws a spear at him. Some of you are like, yeah, that's called Christmas in my house. (laughs) Well, maybe you can relate. And you can imagine that, you know, David's a little frustrated, like, Jonathan, dude, your dad literally tried to kill me, Jonathan. No, my dad tells me everything. But David's like, hey, he's like, okay, let me just tell you plainly. There's like a gracious listening there. One of the important things for us to develop in our relationships within the church is a willingness to listen well. Because if you listen well, you will learn to speak well. Isn't that what the book of James in the New Testament tells us? Be quick to what? Post on social media, no. (laughs) Be quick to listen. Be quick to listen. Of the many things I'm thankful for about my wife is she's probably the best listener I've ever known, which is good because I talk a lot. (laughs) Some of you are like, yeah, we can tell, Tim. I mean, pray for her. She's probably just exhausted, you know? I'm just like, come on, come on, come on. She's like, ah. But she listens so well. And I would hope that I learned from her to listen well. It's something I've had to deliberately focus on within my community life in the church. Oftentimes my mind goes to like, oh, I'm just gonna give them immediate advice or I'm just gonna give them a scripture right away and not even let them finish their sentence. But I need to learn to listen graciously. And I think many of us do as well. But that's not the only part. There's also, there's listening graciously, but also speaking honestly. So David's willing to challenge and to push back a little bit. David's like, hey, I I understand you don't think that about your father, but I'm telling you, Jonathan, your dad's crazy. So he's got to push back a little bit. So that is a part of being vulnerable is you're not only willing to to listen well, but to receive and at times give correction. See, in good godly relationships, you challenge illusions. You dare to discomfort one another by telling the truth when it is necessary. You open up about your particular area of weakness. Jonathan was a little naive. David was patient. This is what good community does. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say about friendships and community life. One of them is this. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 5, it says, to flatter friends, only telling them what they want to hear, is like laying a trap for their feet. It does them no good and only harm. Listen well and speak well. Or to use another New Testament command, just to put this in church context, Paul tells the church, not just besties or people who are are married. Paul tells the church, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. But let me ask, how can we rejoice with those who rejoice if we don't listen to one another? How would I ever know what to rejoice over if I don't ask and if you don't tell me? And how can we weep with those who weep if we don't know why they weep? It is necessary for, don't just think, oh, this is only like a best friend situation. Sure, there's a level of depth amongst a marriage or a family member or or a friendship that goes very deep. But some of these marks should still characterize the Christian community. Weep with those who weep 
Rejoice with those who rejoice. How can we do that? Unless we know what is to be grieved and what is to be celebrated. If God is with us, our relationships must be marked by vulnerability. But undergirding this is important. Secondly, if God is with us, we are not only to be vulnerable, but we are to be loyal. That's the second lesson. We are to be loyal. That is, healthy community is committed to the good of one another. We're committed to the good of the other. In verse four, Jonathan says to David, after this exchange, whatever you want me to do, I will do for you. Now, as I said, David, by this time, had married Saul's daughter, and so he was a part of Saul's royal family. And as a result, he would be obligated to attend some of the royal events. In the midst of all this drama and danger, David proposes to skip the monthly royal dinner on the new moon, one at which he was expected to be present. Saul would notice his absence. And this would provide the opportunity for Jonathan to find out whether or not it was his father's intent to kill David. That's the plan. And it's expanded in verses five through seven. Listen, David was well aware of what he was asking the king's son. The only basis that could justify such a request was Jonathan's commitment to David. Look at verse eight and nine. As for you, show kindness to your servant, for you have brought him into a covenant with you before the Lord. That's how Jonathan understood his relationship with, J with David. If I am guilty, David says, then kill me yourself. Why hand me over to your father? Never, Jonathan said. If I had the least inkling that my father was determined to harm you, wouldn't I tell you? Now, loyalty is a tricky word because many of us have expressed or experienced loyalty in perhaps an unhealthy way. And one unhealthy way to express loyalty is what we call blind loyalty, where we just say, I got your back. I'm never going to call you out on your faults. And if anyone comes against you, even if they're right and you're wrong, I'm still going to like stand up for you. And we're going to cut out all the toxic people out of your life. That's blind loyalty. But what we see here is an honest loyalty, a commitment to the good of each other. Notice David is quick to add, hey, if there's any guilt in me, Jonathan, if I'm guilty, I'm not asking you to just like wink at my own faults if they are there. I'm not asking you to pretend as if I haven't done something wrong. That's not the kind of loyalty that we're talking about. It is a commitment to the good of the other. And so David says, if I have any guilt, please let me know. I suppose the opposite of this kind of loyalty, a commitment to the good of another, is a fair weather community member, a fair weather friend, which is really only built on usefulness, where you're only committed to your own good and not the good of other people. Sadly, we see this happen in the church all the time. Someone joins a church, they might even join a group, and so long as they're benefiting personally, everything's fine, but the minute they don't feel like they're benefiting, they're out, and they leave the church. Never asking the question, well, what if my role was actually to benefit others? What if the purpose of me being in the church is not only what I get out of it as a consumer, but what I can offer to it as a contributor? More people need to ask that, especially in the American church today. That's the kind of loyalty that is being highlighted here. But it's often tested in times of troubles. We often say that troubles allow you to see who your friends really are, and this comes out most clearly in times of adversity. Like Proverbs again says in chapter 17, verse 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. 
Have we been keeping up our community life and our friendships and our marriages in times of blessing so that you are prepared for times of hardship? Are we committed to the good of other people that we have relationships with? Now, I understand that some of us might be in a season where we don't know that many people and we don't know that many people very deeply. I understand that. Listen, it takes time in community life to be able to go deep with others. And yet, you might be surprised that if you stick it out, even if it feels like it's not that deep at first, if you just stick it out, you will be surprised that over time, the depth will come. See, too many people, they, they, they join a new group, they join a new church, and with three, you know, they show up to the first group and they're like, I want you all to be my best friends. First of all, don't say that. It's weird for everybody. It's just weird. But it doesn't acknowledge the fact that this takes time. But don't ignore the fact that those moments week by week do add up. Listen to the words of Hugh Black, who wrote a book on community life and friendship. He says, through little occasions of helpfulness, we are training for the great trial, should it ever come, when the fabric of friendship will be tested to the very foundation. Note the phrase, little occasions of helpfulness. See, you may be in the church for a while and going to a group and you take for granted the little occasions of helpfulness. Like when someone says, hey, will you help me move? It's like, I just thought our Christian community would be super deep and you're just asking me to help you move. It's like, hey, settle down. It's through those repeated little acts of helpfulness that over time strengthen the fabric of the community life so that when trial comes, you might be, dis- you might be surprised how strong it is. Do not take for granted the little acts of helpfulness. It will take time. And it will take time with people that may even surprise you. I'm thinking right now of a particular man in my life back in our time in LA when we were living there. He was a part of our community group. I really had nothing in common with him. He kind of annoyed me, if I'm being honest. But he was there in our community group. And then a year goes by, and then another year goes by. But surprisingly, like towards the end of those two years, he became more and more involved in my life. I began to appreciate his perspective more and his encouragement more. And as each year went on, he became more and more a valued part of my life, even though it was totally unexpected and it took a long time to get there. How did it get there? How can I get there? Through the little occasions of helpfulness over time. Don't take them for granted. And don't take the people around you in this room for granted. Sure, they may not have made your your wish list for the community life, but we would do well to thank God from the bottom of our hearts that if you're a Christian, that you even know another Christian. Let us thank God for that and begin to invest day by day however slow it might be, so that the fabric of our community life could be strengthened through commitment. But that raises the the question, well, what is the foundation for that commitment? We must be vulnerable, loyal, but thirdly, we are to be faithful or God-dependent. If God is with us in our relationships, they must depend upon him. They are to be rooted and grounded in faith. Jonathan goes on to make this long speech to David and it ends with the word covenant, verse 16 and 17. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, may the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan and David, or Jonathan had David reaffirm his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. You can read it later, it's quite a long passage, but in 11 through 17, Jonathan takes David away from earshot. Remember, his friendship with David would have been considered treason. 
And in his speech, his speech that takes up six verses, God is mentioned nine times. What was at the center of their relational life? God. In these six short verses, when Jonathan gives him this speech, what's that relationship all about? God, 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 God. Their relationship was built on him. Now, practically, Jonathan knows that God is with David and that David would be the future king of Israel. Jonathan is about to find out if you read the rest of the chapter, that his father, Saul, is indeed consumed with rage and anger and is planning on killing David. And so here, Jonathan and David reaffirm their covenant. Their relationship was not based on circumstance or mere common interest, but covenant. That is a binding relationship. Who binds it? God. It is God that binds people together at the deepest level. Look, we're going to have all kinds of relationships in this life, and many of them will not share faith. But the deepest relationships of all are the ones that are founded in God. It means we recognize that relationships are not just a random fact of life, but they are to be connected to the grand goal of life knowing and loving God. And the word used in this passage is loving kindness or steadfast love, the famous Hebrew word hesed. It's a reflection of God's love. See, listen, that in the Bible, the deepest relationship between two people is actually three. It's God at the center. And verse 42 captures this, and I love this. My favorite verse in the chapter. Jonathan said to David, go in peace, for we have sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord is witness between you and me. Or the ESV renders it simply, may the Lord be between you and me. How can a relationship truly be strong? Is if God is in between you and me. David's distress made it really hard for him to, to see ahead, but Jonathan gives him perspective that is rooted in God. And it would not be the last time. A few chapters later, after David has to escape for his life and they're able to meet up together, what does Jonathan say to David? What could he say to someone who's suffering and struggling and in a time of trial in his life? 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse 16, Jonathan went to David and encouraged him to stay strong in his faith in God. If you have your Bible open, underline that verse. When you're meeting up with someone this week for coffee or when you're gonna see a friend or relative during the holidays and you wonder, what can I possibly say to this person? Here are your marching orders. Encourage them to stay strong in their faith in God. What do I have to offer to this other person? Encourage him or her to stay strong in their faith in God. Friends, spiritual relationships, the deepest relationships of all are built on more than circumstance, more than preference, more than just similar likes and dislikes. They are rooted in God. So in the New Testament, the church is called a new covenant community. It's not called a new circumstance community. It's not called the shared preference community. When Jesus said, upon this rock, I will build my church, he didn't say, you know what? Upon these shared similarities, I will build my church. Upon shared hobbies, I will sh build my church. Upon shared NFL teams, I will build my church. And all the Cowboys fans in Reality Ventura were like, yes, I see you with your jerseys. Upon shared love of surfing and hiking and whatever else it be, I will be. That's not what Jesus says. It is upon this rock being me, Jesus Christ, I will build my church. 
our relationships are built on and centered upon God himself. He is the foundation. He sets the direction. May the Lord be between you and me. How many times have I been encouraged by my friends and by my community members to stay strong in my faith in God? There are countless times where I've been depressed or discouraged and people have come alongside of me and encourage me to stay strong in my faith in God. There are people even in this church here in Reality Ventura that I don't even know that well and they'll just cruise by and they'll say, Tim, I'm praying for you and your family. Now, I know some of us take that for granted. Like, of course, Christians would say that. But have you, ever, have you ever stopped to think of how amazing that is? That someone you don't even know well, in a world that is generally self-centered, that someone would say, I have taken time not only to be mindful of you, but to intercede to the God of heaven for you and your spouse and your children. Never take that for granted when someone says, I'm praying for you. What a beautiful thing that is. That you and I, because of Christ, we can be an incredible source of encouragement to one another. If God is with us, our relationships are to be God-centered. And that's not just in the abstract. It's demonstrated in action. And that's the last point. If God is with us in our relationships, we are to be humble. That is, we must be willing to take second place in this community. We must be willing to be sacrificial in the way that we relate to one another. Here's the thing about the friendship between David and Jonathan. It never should have happened. It never should have happened. They should have been, by the world's standards, enemies and adversaries seeking each other's downfall. Why? Because Jonathan was the heir apparent. Jonathan could have said, my dad's on the throne. Guess who's getting that throne next? Me. I'm the son. Jonathan should have seen David as his opposition. But he didn't. God knit their hearts together. And that's what makes this whole scene not just memorable, but remarkable. In verse 41, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. They kissed each other and wept together but David wept the most. If you read the rest of the chapter, and I would encourage you to do so on your own time, they had to devise a plan after Jonathan found out that his dad was crazy and wanted to kill David, where he would shoot some arrows out in the field where David was hiding, and they had a code, and it signaled to David that it was his time to escape. Thankfully, they're able to meet up later. And in this moving scene, it's more than just affection. I know us Western people aren't used to the like show of affection and, and the kiss as we often see in other countries. But I just want you to notice here that there's more than affection going on. Jonathan's behavior toward David actually had a political dimension. See, in the ancient world and in the Old Testament, a kiss was not only an expression of friendship, or family, as seen throughout the Bible, but also a veneration. The prophet Samuel kissed Saul when Saul became king as a sign of veneration. One of the famous examples of this is in Psalm chapter 2, where all the kings of the earth are called to kiss the son, speaking of God's anointed king. The kiss is an expression of humility an acknowledgement. So listen, this here is not only a sign of affection, but also a sign of Jonathan's glad acceptance that David will be the future king and that there would be no hostility between them. 
the crown prince Jonathan is willing to lay aside his robe and lower himself for the other. Now, where do we find such strength for this kind of sacrifice and humility? Where do we find the strength to lower ourselves and put others before us within this community? Well, I hope it's obvious, but this is the shadow of but a greater story of Christ. The greatest crown prince of all, the son of God, who we remember at Christmas, what did he do? He lowered himself. He laid aside his robe. He laid aside the glorious crown that he deserves to come into a, not just a cradle, but go all the way to a cross and wear a crown of thorns. He humbled himself. He laid aside the robe of his privilege and on the cross bear the curse for our evil, though he had done none, so that we might be in relationship with him forever. That is love. And so Jesus says in John 15, greater love has no one than this, than that someone lay down his life for his friends. And Paul the apostle echoes this when he says, very rarely will anyone die in Romans 5 for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the God we worship, friends. The God who humbled himself. And so therefore, if God is with us in our relationships, are you willing to take the lower place in this church? Are you willing to be second in your community life to serve someone else in humility? Listen, I know that many of us carry with us disappointments over what we've experienced in some of our friendships, maybe even in your community life in this church. But let me say this as humbly and yet as sharply as I can. Instead of complaining that no one here at Reality Ventura invites you around for meals or that some of the people in this church are unfriendly or that you think some of the conversation is superficial, why don't you take the initiative? Why don't you invite them for the meal? Why don't you change the topic of conversation? Why don't you extend the offer to pray for them? You say, well, why should I do that? Well, because in the gospel, Jesus Christ lowered himself for you. He lowered himself for you to become a friend for you and with you. And it is this forever friendship with Jesus that enables all others to be possible. For whenever you enter a relationship with others, with Christ, there is always three. And though your friendship and community life in this church may go up and down, you can say, may the Lord be between you and me. When the Lord is between you and the other, it can be a place of refuge. Or if there's been pain and hurt, there can be reconciliation and forgiveness. Why? Because the Lord is between you and me. If the Lord is between you and me, it means I can forgive you and you can forgive me. If the Lord is between you and me, it means I can encourage you and you can encourage me. So today I invite you to think about your marriages, your friendships, and all the people in this church and beyond and just simply say, God, may you be in between me and this other person. But that can only happen if you are first with him. If you're looking for steadfast love and forgiveness and security and strength, you will find yourself in the arms of Jesus because he is our savior friend who came to be with us in our own lives and in our relationships. So where do we need healing today for the wounds we've experienced from others? Where do we need to rediscover the joy of even knowing other people? 
And where do we need to come out of our isolation and just take off the mask? Well, we find it all in Jesus. So let's come to him even now. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would first respond by coming to you, to be with you during this time of response and worship. I pray that we would have a tangible sense of your presence here with us. I pray for those who do not yet know you that right now they would make that decision to trust in you, Lord Jesus, for their salvation and forgiveness. And I pray that we would all come to you. That we might be cleansed and renewed. And as a result, God, I pray that you'd bring renewal to our marriages and friendships and our community life, to those we've hurt and to those who have hurt us. I pray that you would renew that sense of joy and encouragement in our relationships and that we'd be the change that we wanna see in our community life. And I pray for those who are just totally isolated that you would bring them out because of their relationship with you that you would bring them into relationship with others. Holy Spirit, only you can do that. And so I pray that even now we would respond with simple faith. In Jesus' name, amen.